you really have to put yourself in the shoes of those people living in those countries, in those conditions. Our mission these days are not just about killing, either. Hi, this is Captain Adam Morton with the Canadian Army Podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about the Peace Support Training Center, or PSTC, and the training opportunities that it brings to the Canadian Armed Forces. With me today in Kingston is Lieutenant Colonel Véronique Gervais, who is the Commandant of the school. Ma'am, welcome to the podcast. Oh, thank you. So, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, as you mentioned, my name is Véronique Gervais, and uh, I enrolled in the Canadian uh, Armed Forces in 1996 as an infantry officer. I graduated from the Royal Military College in 2001 with a degree in French literature, and then I joined the ranks of the uh, 2 Bataillon, uh, Royal 22e Regiment, the Vendus, as it's known in English. Uh, during my career, I've been deployed to Bosnia and Afghanistan, and I've been posted to different training institutions, such as CFLRS, the Leadership and Recruit School in Saint-Jean-sur-Richelieu, as well as the Royal Military College here in Kingston. This summer, I returned from a three-year posting uh, from uh, the NATO Defense College in Rome, Italy. So I've always enjoyed uh, working in training establishments, so it made sense to me that I continue on that path. Uh, taking over command of the PSTC was number one on my wish list, so I was really pleased when I was appointed in that position. Uh, but just so you know, when I was asked about doing this podcast, the reason I accepted is not to talk about me. I uh, kind of recently discovered that many uh, Canadian Army personnel, as well as well as CAF members, do not know what PSTC is, what it does, and in some cases that we even exist. <laughs> <laughs> and and yeah. that, that's really ironic in a sense, because PSTC is well known internationally, but not so much uh, nationally. So thank you for this opportunity. It's funny, uh, one of my first experiences in the reserves was coming to PSTC and doing some training here with uh, the Warrant Lalonde, who oh, well. <laughs> you know really well. First of all, I guess it's worth mentioning that another organization that maybe isn't that well known is CADTC, or the Canadian Army Doctrine and Training Center, and PSTC falls under that. What does PSTC do? So PSTC is a schoolhouse, a unit of CADTC, responsible for the delivery of specific individual training. Each year, we train around 1,000 members of the CAF, of other uh, Government of Canada department, and foreign military personnel either here at the center in Kingston or at other locations within Canada and even internationally. And during the past 15 years, we have also evolved as the Canadian Army Center of Excellence for Information Operation, what we call MFOOPS. And uh, we provide baseline courses on civil military cooperation, which we call CIMIC, and psychological operation, PSYOPS. We currently deliver six different courses on those topics, one on MFOOPS, two on CIMIC, and three on PSYOPS. How did PSTC come to be? How was the need identified for the school, and then how did it all come together? In 1996, uh, PSTC was created as a, just a small training center of eight people, uh, and their mandate was to provide basic deployment training for all personnel who did not belong like, to a formation, those who did not have access to uh, specific training facilities. So the majority of PSTC original clients, if I can say, uh, came from the Ottawa region and other HQs uh, across the country. So in two years after, in 1998, after conducting training to prepare those members for United Nations mission at that time across the globe, uh, we received our first accreditation from the UN. Uh, in 2000, that's not long ago, only 20 years ago, uh, we became an official unit within the Canadian Armed Forces. So right now we're currently in our 24th year of operation, which is uh, pretty young for a unit. Yeah, and doing some pretty interesting stuff too. So speaking of free deployment training, I think of the, the conversations I have with soldiers and sometimes my own feelings on pre-deployment training. You know, some people are like, why am I doing all this extra training when I have already done training? That's why I am, you know, what I do. Why is pre-deployment training important? Well, because it gets you really ready for the type of mission you're going to. So, yes, you're trained, but you're trained for a generic purpose or in your specific trade. And here we deliver different type of pre-deployment training. 
So there's the individual pre-deployment training, what we call here IPT. So this one is designed to really uh, prepare selected CAF personnel for overseas uh, mission. So members come here, uh, they have been uh, trained in their trade, but they still need a detailed refresher on like tactical skills and specific approach to uh, the mission in which they will take part of. So what we do is we uh, dust off their basic soldier skills uh, and we get them back into a comfortable position so they feel confident and ready to deploy. So on our last course, we had people uh, preparing for deployments to Mali, Congo, and Sudan. So this is not something you train for at your normal unit. Right. So the training touches on diverse topics such as combat first aid, which is not only for combat situation, I must say, but it focuses on the dangerous everyday life in the developing world. Other example of things that we teach on this uh, training are explosive threats and IED awareness, preventative medicine, uh, convoy drills, firing weapon, human right awareness, and so on. So candidates will also receive up-to-date information on the in-country health, Uh, personal safety, cultural and political awareness, that type of training. So another type of training that we deliver, it's called SFCB, which stands for uh, Security Force Capacity Building. So it consists of those activities that seek to build the the capabilities of other security forces. As an example, uh, we train our CAF member deploy in Ukraine, Iraq, uh, Jordan and Lebanon on this subject which deal with, again, a wide range of topics from uh, effective employment of a language assistant, working with an interpreter, pretty much, negotiation technique, uh, teaching within another culture, and diversity management, just to name a few. And we also deliver two other types of pre-deployment training, one for civilian from other government uh, department, which is called the Azardus Environment Training, Everybody calls it HET. And also our UN accredited course, the UNMEN, uh, United Nations Military Expert on Mission. So just for this course alone, since 2018, uh, the international commitment has been such that uh, we've seen students and instructors from seven different countries like Ukraine, Peru, Switzerland, and Malaysia. I find it interesting that you uh, you talked about cultural training because that's you know, again, I think part of my training here was a, a one day kind of cultural training brief. And it really makes you realize that people don't think the way that I do necessarily. You know, they talk about the importance of time for some cultures versus other cultures and a bunch of other factors. What are some of the challenges with cultural training, especially when you're talking about international operations in Iraq and then Mali, very different environments? What are the challenges there? Often when we talk about deployment in other countries, people just think about like the physical danger, the unpredictability of some area where our soldiers uh, are deployed to. But I believe that on the cognitive side, one of the hardest things to prepare for is to avoid the use of the Canadian lens to influence our perception. It's to try to see things through the lenses of the nation you're dealing with. Uh, understanding their needs, how they perceive themselves, the situation they are in. And this is extremely hard, but it's normal that it's hard because we all have our normal biases, our own personal experiences that shape our vision of things. And, you know, you can read as much as you want to prepare yourself for those deployments. And I strongly encourage that effort. But you also have to go in those countries with an open mind. You cannot take anything for granted or assume things uh, because you will be surprised one simple action can be interpreted in a whole different manner. That's an interesting point. I'm sure there's probably some combat arms soldier out there. I'm a combat arms guy, so I'm not saying this in a negative way, but there's probably a soldier out there thinking to himself right now, I'm a combat arms guy. I have a specific job out there. Why do I care how other people think? For your like average corporal, What impact does understanding that culture have on the mission for them? If a corporal or whatever rank go in a mission with an attitude like that, they won't succeed. 
That's for sure. Just you really have to put yourself in the shoes of those people living in those countries, in those conditions. And uh, but usually the, our, our troops get it pretty quickly. And our mission these days are not just about killing either. Yeah, exactly. You think about a combat mission and even in a combat context, understanding how other people think and other people act makes your job that much easier, I would say. Yeah. So can you give us an example of maybe there was a cultural misunderstanding that led to a mission becoming more complicated than it otherwise might have been? Just from my personal experience in Afghanistan, we could see at one point that what we thought, from our point of view, that would help some villagers was to uh, provide wells in their, uh, in their village. But for those people, all they really wanted was a vet for their cows, for their animals, because we were back to basic needs. And without their animals, they will not be uh, surviving, pretty much feeding their families and all that. So thinking about a well makes sense, like av availability of water. It's a basic need, too. But for them, most importantly, was to treat their animals right uh, take care of the animals so they could feed the village, feed their families. That's a great example. Yeah, and also you talked about using interpreters and the proper employment of that. So let's say you're watching TV and it's like a war movie or Afghanistan or whatever, and you just see a platoon commander with their interpreter. You know, that seems pretty straightforward, but as maybe you know and I know as well, but maybe others don't, that's a complicated process. Why do you need to know how to use an interpreter? Because, like, the first thing, do you speak to the interpreter so that the interpreter speaks with uh, your host, your guest? Or you keep looking in the eyes of your guest and the interpreter does his job on the side? People don't know that. You don't know until you really go through our training and say, the reason why we're doing this this way. And, and also, there's so much more than just words also. Uh, words are important, the physical aspect of explaining ourselves, and sometimes little gestures for us mean nothing, but they could mean something else depending on who you're speaking with in their culture. You know, just shaking hands mean different thing in different culture or stuff like that. And that's the thing is, now we're talking about a lot of different layers here. So you have your own cultural values and biases. So you're going into another country with that inside of you. Then there's an additional language barrier and all that. But then you add the intermediary of a third person who is also acting as a filter in some ways. That's a lot of that's a lot of moving parts to just talk to another person. Oh, yeah, and there's lots of things, of course, lost in translation. Like I come back from three years in Italy, and I must say most of the people over there, they just speak Italian. A few do speak French or English. And you would think that, oh, it's just Europe. They are really similar to us. No, I discovered pretty quickly that, no, we have different culture, uh, that our, our roots are different, so we think differently. And uh, I'm not talking about a country in Africa where there's obvious differences. Those are like really cousins to us, especially me uh, being a Franco. But no, there's a lot of differences. And uh, it was hard, I must say, to adjust. But again, you need to go there in other countries with an open mind. Yeah, absolutely. And like you said, you're, you're talking about maybe a G8 nation. And even then, it's complicated. And then you go to something, for example, Afghanistan, where you have nomadic tribes that don't even consider political boundaries to be real boundaries. And yet in our minds, that's just, that's a thing that's real, but for them, it doesn't exist. And that's just a very small thing that in terms of military operations can be a huge challenge to overcome. Oh, it play a factor. And that's why we give all those courses. So people take in consideration those things when they do plan, they do plan operations. It's not just about the kinetic effects. That's right. All right. I think that pretty much covers everything we need to cover here. Uh, is there anything else you wanted to add? Ah, yes, of course. <laughs> Thanks <laughs> yeah. for giving me the floor for that. <laughs> so we do have an open invitation to members who have completed their pre-deployment training here at PSTC. We want them to return after their deployment and pass on all the information, the experience that they gather from their mission to other deploying members. As well, as a training institution, we're lucky to have extremely knowledgeable staff. But 
it's a plug here. But we also have several <laughs> reserve employment opportunities, what uh, guys call RIOs in the military language, available for a reserve force. And we're always looking for motivated NCOs and officer instructors to join our team. And finally, if I may, in these COVID times, when more people are working from home, I want to highlight an opportunity for any CAF member who might want to do some professional development or learning something different. So PSCC is a partner of PODI, the Peace Operation Training Institute, which provides e-learning at no cost on multiple subjects, uh, such as introduction to the UN system, different courses on women, peace and security agenda, child protection, uh, leading in peace support operation, just to name a few. So it's free and you can earn individual certificates. So you can find the link to our PSTC e-learning platform directly on our PSTC page. All right. So check it out on Google. <laughs> Do your Google searches or talk to your chain of command and they will help you get in touch with the commandant of PSTC to do that professional development. Thanks so much for coming on the podcast, ma'am. Ah, no problem. Thanks for the invite. That was Lieutenant Colonel Viganik Gervais, Commandant of PSDC. I'm Captain Adam Morton. Don't forget to subscribe and check out our back catalog of episodes. There's a lot of good stuff in there. And as usual, stay frosty. Stay frosty.